the merger of Raytheon and United Technologies just before the lockdown, Mark Russell, as chief technology officer of the new combined Raytheon Technologies, has a team of 60,000 engineers. Some task, eh? But he joins us now. Mark, how's it going? Alan, first, thank you for taking the time. Uh, It's a really uh, good day, and I appreciate uh, having this discussion. I'm excited. It's going great. Uh, I'm your chief technology officer, and I've been in the industry for 38 years, uh, aerospace and defense, and I've really loved it. And uh, this company for a, a techie is awesome. So let me get into it a little bit. We merged Raytheon Company uh, and, and United Technologies. United Technologies, as you know, was uh, made up of Pratt & Whitney and Collins. So think big mechanical engines, uh, Collins, everything avionics and so on, uh, from, from pressure systems to, to motors all over the world. Right? Raytheon Company, think missiles, radar, space systems, avionics all over the world international. And guess what? 60,000 plus engineers, 40,000 patents, two research groups, pretty impressive. And, and uh, I, get, I get all the toys and everything I want to play with. And what I found, which is exciting, is, is uh, um, that these two companies have actually, uh, uh, the finance people talk about synergies. I talk about how do we solve hard technical problems. And today I'd like to talk a bit more about that. But I think it's been great. Um, as you know, I, I worry about everybody's well-being. I hope you're well and your family. Uh, we have been managing this, this new company. I'm um, here in Waltham, Massachusetts, where our headquarters is. But everybody is working as much as they can from home. We do have manufacturing sites up and working, of course, around the world. Research divisions in Rome, Ireland, engineers in Italy and so on, and, and, and India and so on. But, um, you know, it's a challenge. We're making it work. We're also being mindful uh, of everything going on in society today. So um, we got to make it work. And uh, the engineers are excited. The one thing you can all come together on is uh, how exciting we're, you know, half the company's engineers, uh, the new technology. So I uh, think uh, big mechanical meets big electrical. Uh, looking at an engine, I've never designed an engine before. First thing I did was ran down and, and to where they build the uh, uh, new engines for Joint Strike Fighter or the commercial engines. And uh, it's amazing some of the thermal problems are solving just on the blades and the hot side. And guess what? We build hypersonic missiles that go a mile per second. The temperatures get to amazing temperatures, and we got somebody who can solve the materials problems we have. And oh, by the way, we're pretty good at seekers and missiles. So it's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to it. Well, I think as well, you've got that balance. You said mechanical and electrical, but there's also civil and defense, which for Raytheon is a much, much better balance. So how are you finding having to integrate the civil business? Well, on the civil side, of course, uh, because all civil or even commercial is a good way to think about it. Um, And you'll see that um, two things really come to mind. Um, I came originally from the defense side. Uh, Think Patriot system and so on. What I've learned is on the defense side, we design systems based on threats. How far can we detect something? What's a low observable? On the commercial side, it's a commercial pull. What are the things that they need from uh, energy efficiency to size and weight that will be a market pull where they can, they can win in the marketplace with the right discriminators? So it's fascinating to see how we derive the technologies we need. We do end up with the same core technologies, though, from added manufacturing to power systems to thermal management. So it's interesting. The, the kind of power system you need for a directed energy weapon, uh, think megawatts, is the same system you need for electrification and planes. Literally, the identical problems you're trying to solve at that component level uh, uh, done in our Collins uh, Rockford plant are helping both. We just have to connect people. Uh, recently, we had a uh, town hall meeting where engineers were going to talk about one topic. I think it was power. There were 1,000 people on a Zoom meeting. I think we broke Zoom. I'm not sure they might do 1,000. I think we had to go to WebEx. I'm learning all about new, new, uh, new kinds of ways to communicate. So, Mark, what can we expect from the combined company to be different in terms of technological achievements? Well, I think that what's different is uh, we're not only going to have a more connected uh, uh, airspace, if you will, but more of a cyber secure. So you think you think in the old Raytheon side, you got Raytheon Technologies where they do actual cyber security as products and cyber security for our weapon systems. Well, Connected airspace now has to be very cyber secure. So you're going to see uh, uh, connected uh, cockpits and so on, but more cyber secure, which is a big deal. 
I mean, really, uh, probably the anti to the game to playing in the civil side these days. Uh, secondly, you're going to see uh, um, the reliability and, and, uh, and mission assurance is still going to be number one. You're still going to have to have products that are reliable and affordable. And those are the kind of things that the, the civil side is really going to drive. You can't have failures. You can't have uh, reliable, reliability issues. And mission assurance is going to drive the whole company. But I think what we're going to learn a lot about is the affordability. How do we drive to a price point? How do we drive down the costs? And at the end of the day, um, when you look at some of the uh, civil side or what I call the commercial side, you're going to see that they've really become experts at hitting certain price points, which I think is awesome. And what about that? Is it on a global point? I mean, do you see there being a lot more going on around the world rather than all being centralized in the United States? Yes. Yeah, so great point. So, so, you know, when you think about what's going on around the world and everything, you're going to see we're doing uh, technology and engineering, co-development. Uh, uh, engineers are in everywhere from India to Poland to Puerto Rico to, to Australia. Uh, we did the Air War for Destroyer with a thousand engineers sitting in Adelaide. We have engineers in, in the Middle East. We have engineers in, down the street from you in London, Alan. And uh, I think all the, all the disciplines, all the domains uh, are important. And remember, um, when you talk to engineers, they tend to identify themselves. I'm a control system engineer. I'm a, I'm a fluid dynamics engineer. So the, it's really fascinating how the engineers have come together. They don't always associate themselves with a company or a location. They always associate themselves with the domain that they're proud of. And that's what's exciting is, is because people want to solve that hard problem. If they can get help from somewhere else, the collaboration is amazing. And that's part of my job is to pull that thread across the company and make these connections. And as I learn everything about the company, uh, you know, it's amazing where from my office here, I can talk to somebody in Rome who knows control systems, who's going to solve a problem in control systems we have on, on a missile that has to travel, you know, at hypersonic speeds or something. So pretty exciting. Uh, of course, we've got to make sure everybody's uh, um, in the defense side stick to the ITAR compliance and the, and the classification. But you know what? Technology problems are kind of ubiquitous around the world. They're, they're kind of the same, right? You know, if you're an electrical engineer, you all took the same electronics classes in college and you all came out and learned how to build a power device out of silicon carbide or something. And so it's, it's really kind of exciting. Uh, as you can tell, I'm, uh, I, I, uh, I start uh, getting a little bit more uh, upbeat when you ask me those kind of questions. So I want to take it now from a customer perspective. How is it for customers? What are the benefits that Raytheon Technologies will, as a combined business, bring to a customer that's been used to working with maybe the smaller businesses? Yeah, so I still think the entire company is, is about being closer to the customer. We make decisions as close to the customer as we can. And, and the programs and the program managers are still running thousands of programs. What's happening, though, is that program manager, that product line leader, that, that uh, systems lead is getting help from a much bigger swath of engineers, people, company, and they can bring to bear uh, uh, supply chain and operations that have larger volumes. They can bring to bear a bigger buy so that when they go through and design something, the commodities will become at us at a higher, higher volume. And in the end, we'll find that problems have been solved somewhere else in the company that we can say, hey, we don't have to resolve this problem. It's been solved here. And then pushing the state of the art is a big deal. If we think about it, you, you, you can't foster innovation without having the, the, the hardest problems identified. You first got to talk about what they are. We have the materials problem. We have a semiconductor problem. We're a big systems problem. We got to share the problem, and then we got to have people work on it together. So uh, it's pretty amazing to watch this in only a few months. Pretty amazing to watch all the engineers get together and solve the problems. The customers are thrilled. The customers want to see the problem solved in and, and, and the, and the fastest way and, and actually the most affordable. Um, Greg Hayes, our CEO, tends to say I use my watch, not my calendar when I think about schedules. And I think that's a great analogy. Uh, we're going to have to solve the problems in a very fast way because the world needs these problems solved. And culturally, that does bring quite a change because engineers generally think in silos so how do you see yourself encouraging the new technology thoughts to be shared on a collaborative type of basis? You know, that's a really good point. When you think about engineers, they tend to live in their silos. They tend to be, I'm a materials engineer. I've been doing this for 30 years. I've written papers. I have patents. The way to think about it, though, is the one thing about engineers that's really, and scientists that's really unique, 
is they crave learning. They want to hear about what someone else is doing that they respect, that are working in the field of the same stature that they are, whether that, whether that uh, engineer is working in London or whether that engineer is in Germany, wherever they might be, I find that the superstars, the technologists who are really the best of the best, they know each other. You know, I'm a radar engineer by trade 30 years ago. So as soon as I talked to somebody in Japan about radar, it's like, oh, Mark, you know, you wrote a paper on this. We're best friends. So the silos aren't there when you start talking about domains because they really know each other. They're in the same societies, uh, whether it's National Academy, whatever it might be. And that gets it broken down. So what engineers really want is they want to know that the people they're talking to are the best of the best. And I think within Raytheon, I can honestly say we have brought together the best of the best uh, scientists and engineers. Uh, it, 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 and I guess I should say that I'm the CTO, and what I've seen is really incredible. Uh, so we're a technologies company. So let me take you now maybe two generations down. How are you inspiring the potential engineers of the future to get them to understand the breadth of what you can offer with Raytheon Technologies? So first of all, we don't just start by hiring out of college. Uh, I was lucky enough to have the company pay for my master's degree. And we still pay for PhDs and masters in the domains we're interested in, from materials to radars and so on, to all kinds of universities. So we not only work with the university to hire people, we do research at that university, and we, we co-develop and bid programs with technology organizations like NASA or NSF or DARPA. So we're developing a relationship with the professors and the students right from the beginning. And we're giving those students the hardest problems as summer jobs, as working with professors on research and eventually going on to whatever learning they're going to do. And by the time they've come in, I don't like to say this is the most important thing. I want engineers who want to solve the hardest problems. I know I have a great scientist if I say, this is a really hard problem. We haven't figured out how to solve it. And they never sleep. They're thinking about it every day. Saturdays, they wake up and say, I think I understand this. I want them to have fun working. It's a great company to work at, and it's a lot of fun. If you're testing a, a scramjet engine in a lab you know, where, where it doesn't work right away, but you can solve it, I started off my career working the Patriot system at White Sands Missile Range, most fun I've ever had. Fly missile, fix radars. We think that when kids come out of school, when, when they get done with some certain amount of college, seeing the practical application from designing a semiconductor to designing an engine, hot side, or an avionic system, it's, it doesn't really matter what the exact problem is. When we put them in integrated product teams with mechanical, electrical systems, and they get to work as a team, I find that's the biggest unique thing about uh, uh, college students. They collaborate. They want to be on teams. They want to work together amongst the disciplines. They're just not sitting by themselves trying to solve a problem. So this team thing and collaboration, despite the whole pandemic, is still happening. It's just happening in different mediums. But I think team is, is the way to think about engineers working together. So Mark, finally, if we're looking into the future, give me an example of the future technologies that we're going to see like AI and machine learning. What's it all about? Well, think of machine learning is, is an amazing new technology. We're just kind of hitting it at the very beginning. But think machine learning can do everything from help us with language translation for the warfighters or for anybody boarding a plane, all the way to at some point, once you start developing millions of lines of code, you can't all of a sudden have people writing the code and debugging it. You're going to have to have machine learning. And machine learning is going to help you solve very uh, large system problems, and you're also going to be able to get to a point where the machines start helping you making decisions with assisted decisions, not just you know by themselves, but you also want them doing the hard uh, uh, um, crunching, if you will, uh, through the data. And so you think big data, you think about everything from facial recognition to sorting out targets to, to figuring out you know the airspace over the, the capital region. These are things that humans can no longer look at a screen and figure out. So I think it's very exciting. And I think the winner in the future is going to be someone or some company that applies machine learning in a way that can most advance our products to the next level. And I think Raytheon Technologies is that company. That's a great insight. Mark, thank you very much. Thank you.